like to introduce you to uh, Jade Lewandowski, an anthropologist from the United States of America, who did the undergraded studies in Washington. And the topic is? So the topic is on queer activism. And so I did ethnographic research in Amsterdam and in DC, Washington. Um, and so I did a kind of a comparative analysis of queer activists in both settings. And I focused on the usage of the word queer um, as an organizational term, both for personal identity, but mainly in terms of group structure. Um, so how I came to this research was actually through a program, uh, the School of International Training, um, with one of their locations based in Amsterdam. And so during my courses there, I came in contact with various um, queer folk, and I asked them about their activist activities, and I started to volunteer specifically at one location named the Brinkreich, um, which is kind of a self-titled queer soup kitchen club of sorts. <laughs> okay. um, and so while I was there, um, I got to know many of the people that would then be my interviewees, um, kind of built rapport with folks there and kind of got to see this sort of self-titled queer setting and what that meant. Um, and so while I was there, I decided to then pursue that as a research topic because I was interested in their use of the word queer since in the United States it has a very different, not extremely different meaning, but it has a very loaded term in the United States due to its history as a pejorative you know, slur. Um, and from my time in Amsterdam, I found that there wasn't that same connotation um, with its use there in the Netherlands. Um, and so I shouldn't say broadly all over the Netherlands, but mainly I found through my research that the term queer came to be there mainly through academia in terms of scholars such as um, you know, Judith Butler claiming this term and then their work being read in the Netherlands. And from there, these English words, you know, queer and gay started to be used more than the Dutch terms. Uh -huh. um, and so that's kind of how it proliferated into the mainstream. But there wasn't any recognition, I guess, of its kind of pejorative use in the States. And so that's how I kind of got interested in this topic. Um, and so I started to kind of analyze this aspect of using queer both to label a space, but then also as a term that people wholeheartedly claimed. And how did they define this seemingly undefinable term? Um, so that was kind of one portion of my work. And so I, when I published a paper there and through that program in the Netherlands, I came back to the United States for my final semester um, for my undergrad degree. And I decided to continue this work. One of my professors advised me to continue that work, but try to situate it within DC. And mm -hmm. so through a similar approach um, by going to various events, I you know, various events, either that included queer in the title or events that I could kind of push, you know, push the letter a bit and push people on the topic. Um, I kind of found this intersection of queer and professionalism that was very different, shockingly so to me as having just come from Amsterdam where I'm in a very, you know, club scene and everyone's in extravagant outfits. And then coming to DC and people are labeling themselves queer, but wearing a suit and tie, I kind of felt like, you know, there's something going on here that needs to be unpacked. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, going into various settings where I went to um, various job networking events that were either for marginalized or queer folk, um, I also interviewed peers, professors, um, people working in D.C. and how they kind of rationalize this intersection of queer and professional and if they saw any issues or if they were 
fully embracing of it. And from that, I kind of got more into the history, at least within the United States, but then also connecting that with my research in the Netherlands on its, you know, usage, as well as kind of, again, how activists have used it and for their own initiatives. Um, and so something I found was that this pejorative use, you know, it's being reclaimed in the United States, but many mm-hmm. people still struggle to use it um, and are vehemently against using it. Um, and so there's some frameworks that, you know, suggest that words can never be reclaimed um, in terms of dealing with power and anthropology is always talking about power and structure and stuff like that. Um, but I was interested, I guess in one aspect, of course, in dealing with power, but I was interested then in this reclamation process. And so that's kind of how my work differed from Amsterdam to the States now where I'm looking at this reclamation process and how that then ties with activists' usage of it. Um, So while I was in um, the United States, I used kind of semi-structured interviews Mm -hmm. with folks that um, had some familiarity with the topic, or at least knew of the word queer. Um, And if they self-identified with it or if they didn't, I kind of asked them, you know, do you see yourself as a professional? And if so, how do you compare that with the word queer? Um, And from my work, it was interesting enough, kind of my own bias was kind of highlighted where I assumed there was a sort of tension you know, between these two words, but I often, it was interesting, one of my interviewees kind of unpacked that or kind of exposed that for me to kind of say, well, I define professional from professionalism Mm -hmm. and to say that I can still be queer and I can be a professional, but I don't have to buy into professionalism. And that was kind of an interesting avenue that I decided to explore further in my paper in terms of looking at again, looking at this idea of power, professionalism as a, you know, structure of power that is taken at, you know, face value as being non-political, but is an immensely, you know, loaded term with lots of meaning that many times in this DC professional culture is just written off as standard. And so, through my interviews and through talking through people, I kind of found that there was this distinction made between this professionalism sphere that they found themselves in DC and being a professional, they defined it as just someone who gets work done that, you know, does their job and does it well. Um, And whether that was someone um, who worked in photography in the entertainment industry, or that was someone who you know, worked for um, a psychiatry center. Um, They just, they separated, they parsed out the two to say that, you know, I still get my work done. And for me, that's what being a professional is. But I don't buy into professionalism. I don't have to wear a suit and tie to work every day. And so for me, that's how I define it. Um, Yet at the same time, there was still this distinction from its use in Amsterdam, where Amsterdam queerness was very fluid, very, you know, you hear terms like fluid or um, not fixed, not situated, and that, you know, almost anybody can claim the term queer. Um, whereas in the United States, it seemed to be there was a lot more policing of the term in terms of saying, so for some of my interviews, they said that uh, if you were straight, you could not identify as queer. And so I thought that was, that was kind of an interesting sort of notes where in Amsterdam, there were many people that I met that might've identified as straight or might've been identified in 
a BDSM or kink culture that from my subjects here in the United States, they found that that was not holistically queer. Um, and so again, you kind of see this kind of parsing out of you know, terms and kind of separation for personal identity versus organizational structure. And I attributed that to the history of the word queer, um, where, as I mentioned previously, queer was kind of imported to the Netherlands through academia, whereas its history in the United States starting as, you know, something odd or, you know, foreign to then being a term that became a pejorative slur um, and to now that it's being reclaimed, you know, this kind of history that is also symbolic of the movement, you know, the LGBTQ movement, um, which is to say that earlier movements such as, you know, the famous Stonewall um, as being very, you know, as being a riot against police to now we have pride, you know, parades and stuff in public um, with police. Um, and so how do they, how does the movement kind of reconcile this? Um, I've sort of found that it's kind of an inverse kind of evolution of these activist movements where in Amsterdam, because the movement there started with, um, you know, the AIDS, HIV epidemic, and the government there granted a sort of, they first recognized the LGBTQ population, and they also had them be in charge of the movement in terms of saying that, you know, this epidemic is a you issue, and so you deal with it. Um, of course, then putting the onus holistic totally on them, but there was that recognition, whereas in the United States, there was a, not just not recognizing, but a kind of ignorance or erasure of LGBTQ queer folk. And so how those movements started, you know, in terms of being coded with the government within the Netherlands and being very much fighting the government in the United States, they've kind of inversely grown where now the Netherlands, these movements have become quote unquote radical and in the United States, the movement has kind of depoliticized and being gay is normal. Being queer is, is normal, is cool, is unique, but it's still something that has been, is being commodified, I should say. Um, so in terms of that kind of commodification of the movement, that's kind of, that was the most explicit I guess, separation between the United States and the Netherlands, where the Netherlands are labeling themselves as radical and are now fighting against the government. And in the United States, they're looking for acceptance within the government and within this higher structure. Um, that's kind of how my research from there has kind of progressed. And that's kind of the point where I find myself now looking at these movements and kind of unpacking what what radical movements are looking for, what it means to be radical, radical queer, um, and what does the future of you know the LGBTQ movement in the United States suggest if you know now it's normal that it's accepted, what what future is there for the movement? What further paths do they have to go towards? Yeah, very interesting. And so now we have a slight glance or summarization of what your work was about. Was there a problem or was there any point where you have doubts you could go on or, or where you hit um, obstacles? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, from my work in Amsterdam, I was kind of I was using the framework, um, I was using Bolsdorf's kind of politics of similitude, which kind of looks at sexual activism and the Western subject in terms of positionality, so to speak. And so I was acknowledging myself both as an American in the Netherlands, um, as someone who is not fully fluent in Dutch, 
um, I recognize these kind of limitations of myself as a researcher to say that, of course, the population that I'm accessing within my work, um, if I was fully fluent in Dutch, I would be able to speak to people that perhaps didn't know English and might be able to find out more in terms of gay, queer identity within the Netherlands from someone who is not fluent in English to use the English terms. Um, that is to say, though, that even though, even in the conversation being spoken in Dutch, you'll still hear queer, you'll still hear gay used, <laughs> um, but there might not be a full understanding, or I guess an, under, an American understanding of those terms. And so, again, that was kind of a limitation that I acknowledged in, in that paper. Um, even, I guess, within the United States, an, a limitation I found within my paper was, and oftentimes anthropology finds us where we look, there's this kind of looking down upon subjects versus looking up and punching up to power. And I would have been, it would have been a lot more interesting if I could have access politicians or um, access people working in higher government um, that may have identified as queer or gay um, or might have done work with, you know, the LGBTQ community um, to kind of see if their own ideas of professionalism or being a professional and what that means for them. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to access anyone like that. Um, and so that was something that I kind of, you know, realized with my work that, you know, going forward, that's something that I definitely would want to try to do. Um, I feel as though I wouldn't want that to completely take over, I guess, the direction. I feel like more so it's just another tangent that could add to the work that I'm doing in terms of then looking at the divide within the LGBTQ movements um, in terms of direction of where they see the movement going. Um, in, my, in my paper, I talk um, about Semino and his book where he talks about um, you know, gay Republicans and kind of how, again, that's another seemingly oxymoronic um, intersection of identity where in the United States, Republican is to anti-LGBTQ as, you know, Democrat is to pro-LGBTQ. So how can you be, you know, gay and Republican doesn't seem to make sense. Um, and so he kind of writes about how gay Republicans see the movement going in terms of being kind of codified within the larger structure of just being like, well, I'm just like you, straight person. I'm just gay. There's no other difference between us. Um, whereas, you know, he then goes to talk about queer, radical, radical queer movements to say that, no, we are different and we have different needs and these needs need to be addressed. Um, and that's kind of the, this divide that we see now within these movements um, that I guess going further, you know, and tackling these kind of obstacles, how can we look at these movements um, either to compare or to contrast, but um, going forward, how can these movements form coalitions? Is that a possibility? Um, I think also there's a note that I always have to include to say that I try not to put myself too much in the paper to say that, well, this movement is right, so we should be doing what this movement wants. I always try to make sure that I don't pose that um, into the paper, and I try to make sure that that's something that um, remains absent for the most part in terms of, you know, steering the paper in a completely different direction. Yes, and actually to the point of the coalitions, in your um, thesis you also mentioned homonationalism and tribalism, and I found this very striking because actually it's a, it's a very strong difference between the United States and the Netherlands. 
Um, so one of my advisors in um, the Netherlands, uh, Paul Mepchen, his work, he focuses a lot on homonationalism and kind of the dis- this discourse used by a lot of Dutch politicians um, uh-huh. in terms of using gay, queer identity to move certain policies forward um, or specifically to pit queer folks against, um, you know, how they label it, Moroccan, Turkish, Muslim folks to say again that there these are opposing identities and that um, in order to protect our gay, you know, Dutch citizens, we need to keep these um, Moroccans out. And you'll often see this word for word in, you know, speeches by Dutch politicians. I'm mm-hmm. thinking of specifically um, your builders. Um, and so this homo nationalism, this conjunction of homo and nationalism, that's how that comes into play, where there's this kind of nostalgizing effect of saying, well, to be Dutch is to be accepting of gayness, of the LGBTQ, um, and that's just, that's what it means to be Dutch. So if you aren't accepting, then you aren't Dutch, you don't belong here. Um, That's this nationalist rhetoric. Um, What that obviously ignores is, you know, the history of of their non-acceptance. I mean, if you go further inland to the Bible Belt in the middle of the Netherlands, would not find as accepting folks there um, as you would in, you know, Amsterdam or Rotterdam um, or Utrecht. Um, so it's how can you say that those folks who had lived generations upon generations, you know, within this area of the Netherlands um, are not Dutch? Um, it's a kind of, it's a interesting sort of, I guess, discourse in terms of, you know, they, they address one group of people or how they address one group of people versus how they address another group of people and how they play off, you know, fears. Um, fear is a very powerful thing. And so that was, his work kind of went into that discourse. And I decided to bring that discourse in connection with activism in terms of how activists are responding to homo nationalism. Um, and it, if they are, I should say. Um, and so that's kind of where I see this connection between, you know, these radical queer movements, because that's their, their response to homo nationalism. It is, we're not going to be these, you know, polite, nice, um, you know, commodified gays that you want to use us as, you know, an image representation of what it means to be Dutch, to pit us against, um, you know, and Turkish Muslim folks, you can't use us. And that's kind of their, you know, pushback against this kind of rhetoric. Um, and through one of my interviews, um, I talked to the director of an organization called Maruf, um, which is specifically an organization um, that works with queer Muslims and that looks specifically at this intersection of these two identities. Um, that is to say that they both raise awareness, you know, to the issues that Muslims and queer folks face, and then specifically queer Muslims face, um, and, you know, to draw recognition to be like, hey, we're here, you know, this homo nationalist rhetoric completely erases us, but we are here, so we need to be recognized. And this even recognition of a queer Muslim completely destabilizes this homo nationalist rhetoric that seeks to say that, oh, well, if, um, you know, asylum seekers are coming from the Middle East, that they must be gay and that they're trying to escape this, you know, this horrific, you know, ideology. And that's kind of the rhetoric that kind of backs up this homo nationalist ideology. Um, And so then here are folks who are fully practicing Muslims that you know, practice daily, but then are still queer. That still identifies gay or lesbian um, or queer. And having that, again, having this intersection of identities completely destabilizes this kind of rhetoric that would seek to erase them. Um, 
So that was something that it was actually through that interview that um, Brian Riri discussed um, tribalism and why I brought that up in terms of saying how, again, these activist groups, you know, they might have different motivations for going into activism or they might have different ideas of where they see the movement going. Um, and so the term tribalism came out, interestingly enough, to say that these groups, even these radical queer groups, um, sometimes don't recognize their own privilege or don't recognize when they're overstepping their own boundaries to say that, um, so for example, the rank right, um, this space was oftentimes majority white. Um, and if these folks don't recognize that on one point, yes, they should speak up for their queer Muslim allies, their peers, they also have to recognize when they're speaking over their queer you know, Muslim allies. Uh -huh. And oftentimes this group struggled with speaking over versus speaking with. Uh -huh. um, and I think that's kind of an important distinction that a lot of activists are trying to find in this balance, um, you know, in terms of being an ally for someone and ally as an active term, not ally as just a label um, versus speaking in the interest for and speaking over and not actually asking or acknowledging that group what it is that they, you know, need or what it is that they want. Um, that's kind of where this tribalism aspect comes in, where you have these certain markers of, okay, well, to be within this queer circle, you need to be X, Y, or Z. Um, and that despite, you know, queer being a fluid, a non-structured kind of identity, there were structures that were still in place. Um, there were certain benchmarkers that were still in place that kind of formed this tribe, this queer tribe to exclude those that weren't queer enough. Um, and so to say, in a way, that actually connected to what I found in the United States, um, albeit yeah, obviously in a different context, um, but to a certain extent, there was still this issue with identity where in order to be recognized, you have to have these certain benchmarkers um, in order to be a part of a group, and part of, um, you know, this sort of coalition, you have to have, you have to abide by certain ideology. Um, and so in the United States, it was much more explicit to say that people would exclude that if you were straight and in BDSM, you were considered queer, whereas in the Netherlands, would still be considered queer if you identified that way. Um, that was a kind of different exclusion, but uh -huh. this aspect of tribalism came in more so the active organizing aspect where you didn't see, you know, queer Muslim faces at this meeting, you know, that they were still very separated. Um, and so that was kind of this you know, tension that I was trying to unpack to look at, okay, well, how can these movements, you know, form coalitions and how can these movements come together? Um, and I think that's something that is continually evolving and changing, and especially due to this homonationalist rhetoric, um, is constantly being challenged, um, where Sometimes you even have um, LGBTQ groups that are explicitly, explicitly anti-Muslim. Um, and so then there's, again, another you know, act activist group that has a different idea of the future, has a different idea of progress and what that means. Um, that, in a way, it becomes its own tribe. So there are many, many different groups, although it's under the umbrella term queer, we see that it's very heterogeneous actually, 
So I have a question and I'm not sure if it's uh, a reasonable question and if it can be answered because I wanted to ask you if you see a certain direction where the queer movement is going and maybe there is a more or less clear direction or it's too diverse. So I don't know if you can answer this or not. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that's interesting. And that's something that's obviously I'm thinking about in my work um, going forward. Um, I mean, I feel like it changes almost every day in terms of not necessarily the direction, but the modes that active, the methodology that activists take um, to their work or how they look at their work. Um, in the United States specifically, I can kind of speak to how um, visibility recognition is kind of, it's still touted as the best way or the way to go forward um, for these groups. And while that is definitely one mode of activism, there still is a cautionary aspect to that to say that, okay, well, once the group is recognized, what, what does that do? What do, what do they want? Um, and I think that's also something that governments are constantly wary of and why recognition often isn't there. Um, and so that's sort of a tension to say that this group, so for example, I guess speaking specifically, um, non-binary gender queer recognition understanding what does it mean to be that um and how can that be accepted within the larger society um some groups campaign for acceptance by you know you'll have models that will put hashtags such as visibility or um you will have people that campaign and say oh we have a transgender queer non-binary you know person um and other folks sort of campaign not necessarily to say the complete opposite but to say that you know we shouldn't have one exclusive label or we shouldn't have one exclusive image of what it means to be non-binary because then again non-binary can just be recreated as you know someone who is gay with short hair and piercings and white and what does that do to the you know queer um like queer feminine you know person of color that might not fit within that image you know if we create this image of non-binary as someone who fits you know this like muscled tattoo with piercings white person then another group isn't being recognized and so that's this continual sort of tension that you know groups have to reconcile with especially whenever you have this idea of diversity that um companies love to use and to go on another point in my paper i speak on i speak briefly about um space in terms of you know the rank right as a space labeled as queer but also safe space versus brave space and i guess to address your question more directly um this brave space versus safe space i think is kind of the direction or speaks sort of towards the future of where these movements or activists are looking at mm -hmm. um to say that a safe space for a while was kind of touted as this is what we need to go for we need a safe space where everyone can feel safe to be themselves um where now we have a conversation going on about brave space and what does a brave space mean um a brave space is to suggest that or acknowledge that there is no such thing as a 100 percent safe space and that that's okay but we need to acknowledge why it isn't and we need to have conversations on why it's not. Um, and so that's to say, for example, um, you know, if you have a queer trans um, people of color group, that is to say that, you know, people of color, that is such a, you know, 
term that is so fluid depending on the context. So in you know the Netherlands, someone might be considered a person of color, but in the United States, they might not be. Um, and so these kind of conversations that need to be had within these spaces. Um, another example is um, within queer circles, white people acknowledging their privilege and how that might make them feel uncomfortable, but it's leaning into that discomfort is where you grow, is where you learn. Um, and making sure that that work doesn't completely fall onto um, other queer people of color to unpack that for them and to explain to them that that work is for them to reflect on, for them to grow in themselves. Um, and that's kind of where this brave space kind of comes into play, where safe suggests that everyone is comfortable, that everyone is okay and, you know, you know, kumbaya, there's nothing going on. Um, brave space is where you have these tough conversations and that you might feel uncomfortable, but that's important to recognize why you feel uncomfortable and to further open up that conversation. Um, and I think that's kind of where queer activists are looking at putting their energy. Um, I think that's something that not just queer activists, but um, I know Black Lives Matter in the United States, that's definitely something that they are also looking at, um, putting time into organizing community, but also organizing, um, you know, cross community in terms of speaking with other groups and having these conversations to acknowledge issues, um, to acknowledge issues that might happen to Black people versus Asian people is a conversation that's always being had here in the United States, but also needs to connect to queer issues. Mm -hmm. And so, again, going back to my main work in terms of looking at coalition building, that's the coalition building, that's the brave space, that's where that work happens, is in that brave space, is the coalition building developing from there. Um, I think that's where we're going to find progress, if progress is a narrative that you want to work within. Um, I could go on another tangent about that, but um, I think that's where activists are looking right now. Okay, very cool. Um, this would be a perfect end, I think, for the interview, but I do have one question more, yeah. because this seems to me like an ongoing struggle for recognition also for certain certain subgroups in the queer movement. Yeah. But you use the word struggle a bit uh, different in your thesis. And I think the struggle you mentioned has also a lot of a lot of to do with the motivation why someone becomes an activist. Um, can you maybe talk a bit about the motivation people have? Yeah, so um, I think again that kind of even goes back to this idea of space, safe space versus brave space, um, but struggle as something that is either constant or is situational. I think that's kind of how I separate it, um, and I kind of look at this aspect of someone who might have quote unquote immense privilege and might not struggle constantly. You know, you think of the typical cis white straight male and what that means and you know there might seemingly be oh there is no struggle for that person there might be contextual struggle but there isn't the constant systemic struggle um, whereas the constant struggle is someone who lives in um, a place that either is not accepting of their identity or even lives in a place where environmental pollution is a constant has Mm -hmm. that doesn't on well on one hand it does mean to suffer but it also means to take that suffering and move it into action um i think that's kind of at the core of what activists do um i don't know if i address your question so much. But. I think you did, yes. <laughs>
Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much. These are my questions. I don't know if I have missed any point you would like to mention. Um, no, I think I definitely covered a lot. I don't want to keep you here all day. Okay, well, uh, thanks to you. And I would suggest if anyone has any questions, they can either contact you directly or contact me and I will pass the questions. Awesome. And that's it. Okay, Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jade. Thank you so much.